The late 19th century saw the publication of dozens of history books. None are more remarkable than the history of Cecil County written by George Johnston and published in 1881. Against the backdrop of two powerful British families struggling for dominance in the New World, Johnston shares stories of murder, drunken Irishmen, wars, and the struggles of everyday people to survive in a harsh landscape. The first story we will share takes place on the Maryland and Delaware border. A band of Indians living near what is now Philadelphia were traveling through the English colony of Maryland. Shots were exchanged between the colonials and the Indians. One Indian, the brother of a chief, was killed along with several others. Returning home, the Indian band met four Englishmen passing over Iron Hill. In vengeance, the Indians killed the four men, stripping the bodies of hats, coats, packs, and shoes. The Indians continued on to the Dutch settlements on the Delaware. One Indian was arrested by the Dutch, and the others fled to their own village. They left behind in the Dutch settlement an English coat with a hole in the back, wet with blood, a pair of English shoes and a canvas bag also soaked in blood. A few months later, Maryland made a treaty of peace with these particular Indians, and a major catastrophic war was avoided. George Talbot, grandson of the first Lord Baltimore, was granted a large tract of land on the Pennsylvania border. His many adventures are covered by Johnston. These include the murder of a tax collector and a prison break. In 1684, Talbot made a raid on a plantation only eight miles from Newcastle and drove off William Penn's tenants. About this time, Talbot built a fort which is described as being near Christina Bridge on a spot of land belonging to the widow Ogle, which indicates that it may have been near Ogletown, which he garrisoned with a few of his retainers, not so much for any warlike purpose as to establish and maintain possession of the country west of it. This fort was built of logs and was described by those who had seen it as about 13 or 14 feet long, 10 feet wide, and covered with slip wood. The garrison consisted of six or seven men, Irishmen no doubt, who were esteemed Catholics and behaved peaceably towards the inhabitants, among whom they frequently went the garrison was commanded by one Murray. The garrison continued to hold this fort for about two years until after Talbot went out of power when they got drunk and laid out in the cold from the effect of which they were so badly frostbitten that some of them died and others lost their limbs. One of the earliest churches built by inhabitants of Cecil County was built on the Pennsylvania line at what would later be known as Louisville. A tombstone in this graveyard contains this inscription, in memory of Hugh Mahaffey, who was murdered November 18th, 1747. He lived in New Munster, on the west side of the Big Elk Creek, about a mile south of where the road from Fair Hill to Newark crosses that stream, and was a blacksmith. Tradition saith, that a person who lived with him became enamored of his wife and that he and she entered into a plot to kill him, which they executed in this wise. While Mahaffey and his wife were seated near the fire early in the evening, the cowardly murderer, who had been momentarily absent from the room, stealthily entered it and struck Mahaffey with an axe. The blow knocked him senseless to the floor, but did not kill him. An apprentice boy who was in bed in the loft of the house heard the noise and coming downstairs, the guilty pair compelled him to dispatch his master, threatening, if he refused, to do it themselves and charge him with it and have him hanged. The body was then buried in in the smith shop where, after the lapse of some weeks, it was found in this way. Some of the friends of the murdered man who resided at some distance, hearing of his disappearance, came to assist his neighbors in removing the mystery that enshrouded it, 
and hitched one of their horses in the shop near where the corpse of the murdered man was buried. The horse, knowing by instinct that something was buried there, or being impatient of restraint and wishing to get loose, pawed the earth away from the corpse, which, of course, was discovered. No record of the trial is now extant, but tradition says that the guilty man escaped, that the equally guilty woman and boy were tried for murder, and that the boy was hanged. Another one of the tombstones in this graveyard contains the image of a panther chiseled upon it in base relief. Another one contains the figure of a man's hand, the thumb and forefinger of which are representing as holding in order to exhibit to view the four of diamonds. In a move calculated to push back the claims of the Lord Baltimore, William Penn granted a group of Quakers a large piece of ground in what is now northern Cecil County. The property, including the meeting house constructed in 1735, would play a role in the Revolutionary War. Though the pacific principles of the Friends forbade them to engage in hostilities, they had no objections to taking care of the sick and wounded soldiers. With the view of affording them an opportunity of doing so, a detachment of General Smallwood's division of the American Army took possession of the Brick Meeting House in April 1778 and converted it into a hospital for the use of the sick and wounded soldiers who were disabled in the campaign of that year in northern New Jersey. The meeting house was used for a hospital for about three months, the friends meanwhile worshiping in a friend's barn. The friends treated the soldiers in the hospital with much kindness and furnished them with blankets and other things that contributed to their comfort and washed and mended their clothes. During the time the meeting house was used for a hospital, many of the inmates died and were buried in the graveyard that surrounds it. A well-defined depression in the earth's surface is all that marks the site of their sepulture. The army under Lafayette left the head of Elk on the morning of the 11th of April and marched to the brick meeting house, which they reached about an hour before sunset and encamped in the meeting house woods. The leading divisions were rapidly followed by others until the whole woods, then containing about 30 acres, seemed filled with horses, wagons, and men. But the villagers were surprised to see so many people settle down so quickly in exact order, the men cooking their suppers and sentinels walking about the entire body. None of the inhabitants were molested except to replenish their empty canteens at the old-fashioned draw wells in the vicinity. The British Army landed in the county on its way to capture Philadelphia in August 1777. They occupied the town of Elkton for several days. While the British held the town, they were in the habit of sending out foraging parties, and the Americans at the forge had their scouts on the alert in order to be informed of their operations. It was while doing duty as a scout that a granduncle of the author fell in with a squad of these British officers near the site of the bridge across the Big Elk, north of the town known as Gilpin's Bridge. He was on the north side of their creek and they were on the opposite bank, near where the house stands now. The creek was skirted on each side with bushes and trees, and the old gentleman fired at them before they saw him. To use his own words, one of them settled down on his horse's neck. The old soldier did not think it safe to stay longer at that time, but returned a short time after the evacuation of Elkton by the British and found a fresh grave in the flat between the bluff and the creek. The grave is in the garden belonging to the house that stands near the south end of the bridge. The place was pointed out to the author many years ago by his uncle, to whom it had been shown by the person who fired the shot. The British soldier shot down by Johnston's granduncle is buried here among the brush where the Elkton Newark Road now crosses the Big Elk. History is not a series of dates and musty old records. It cannot be left to bitter old self-hating cat ladies to tell. 
History is a series of short stories written in sweat and blood. George Johnston, despite a limited education, translated that sweat and blood into a narrative that allows us to understand, preserve, and protect that history. For a biography of this remarkable man, George Johnston, please join us on our library channel in the link below. Thank you for watching.